Okay, um, there's a couple of things I'd like to share with you tonight. There's actually three things that I'd like to share with you. Uh, the first thing is that I'd like to share with you is simply globalization and what that means for companies, institutions, and people all across the planet. Secondly, I'd like to talk to you about the technology implications, uh, what that means on a global basis. Uh, and third of all, I'd like to talk to you about Curacao, and we're going to do that all in eight minutes. We are used to, when we talk about globalization, uh, to think of companies conducting trade on a global basis between East and West. Typically, companies investing in either China or India, building development shops, building call centers, building manufacturing plants offshore in those particular jurisdictions. Or we find developing countries uh, that are investing in U.S. Treasury bills or companies or institutions that are residing in Curacao or elsewhere in development countries struggling to try to figure out how they're going to offset their products to the developed world. That was globalization 1.0. In globalization 2.0, the world is being rewired as we speak. And perhaps we don't quite realize it, but the changes are quite dramatic. As a matter of fact, as we speak, companies on a global basis are finding out that it's much easier to do business with each other if you're in an emerging market than try to offset product services in developed countries. So in fact, goodbye are the days when Wall Street and downtown London are trying to vie for positions as the most critical players in the financial services world. The reality is that companies all across the planet in emerging markets are finding new connections, new ways to work with each other, new ways to share information. As a good friend of mine put it, it's Mumbai, Dubai, Shanghai, or goodbye. <laughs> Nevertheless, as we speak today, the world is being rewired, new infrastructures are being laid out, new fiber connectivity is being deployed all across the planet to connect countries that today are simply emerging markets just as ourselves and the implications are quite dramatic. Let me just share with you some facts that I think are quite important that kind of set the stage uh, for our discussions tonight. Um, first of all, it took the radio 38 years to reach an audience of 50 million people, 13 years for the television, and four years for the internet. In 2006, there were 2.7 billion monthly searches on Google, now there are 47 billion on a monthly basis. It took two years to reach 375 million members, and today we're more than a half a billion members on a worldwide basis. You tie all of this together, and the biggest question you have in mind is major connectivity all across the globe between individual, companies, institutions, private entities, all sharing information in a new matter never before anticipated or never before thought of before. We have individuals sharing information. On top of that, we have systems and technology that are sharing information at sub-second speeds as we speak in ways never before anticipated. Companies are trying to figure out on a daily basis what the most economic, most efficient, most effective destination is to locate their technology to reach their customers. And in that place, Curacao plays a role. On top of all of this, we have what's called the cloud computing environment. How many of you have an iPhone? How many have Blackberries? Ah. <laughs> if you do use an iPhone, an iPad, or any Apple device, certainly you're aware of what's called the iCloud, where in fact, music, photos, albums, regardless of what type of media you have on your machine, is being stored somewhere out there called the cloud, which means you and I have no idea where our pictures stay today. As a matter of fact, I visited um, Apple's data center in North Carolina. It's a billion dollar investment, and in that data center, Apple is housing all the necessary infrastructure to roll up every single piece of media that you and I own today, all your music, all your pictures, and everything. And as a matter of fact, they're building a second one in Singapore and the third one being built right in the middle of the Nevada desert in the United States. We have no control of that data. And as a matter of fact, companies, institutions, private individuals, all are trying to find ways 
to move their data into what's called the cloud. That means that we are no longer worried about where our data resides, we're more worried about the most efficient manner to store our data and where it's located. Now, the question is about Curacao and what's our role in this major revolution that's occurring as we speak. And if you look at our history, obviously we've always been known as a historic transshipment point, um, oil refining still active. I know we have uh, quite an interesting conversation later on about the oil refinery plants. Um, our dry dock facilities are uh, still active. Um, the offshore industry is still there. Uh, tourism, also a, a sector that we're focusing on. But the question is, what's next? Where do we head from here, right? And I would argue with you that every single one of these items here, every single one of these bullets here, are items for which we will suffer and we will encounter fierce competition. It's not that Curacao is not an exciting destination to be. It's not that tourism is not an exciting place and we don't have a differentiating value, but the reality is many other places offer tourism as well. So from our perspective, one of the key pillars for our future has to be to become a regional technology and communications hub and content across the region. We have to play in this game. If we don't play in this game, we stand the risk of being far outstripped by other islands, other institutions, other regions that do invest in this technology. And the question for us is really fourfold. First of all, will we lead the region or do we follow it? Do we let fear of change halt progress? Do we take calculated measure risks? And the biggest question of all, for all of us that go out there and study and get our degrees and get our experience, uh, where will we work? Again, the focus for us is really, we believe that ultimately Curacao has an opportunity to evolve itself into a regional gateway where companies that seek to establish themselves or conduct business in the region can use Curacao as a hub. Now, how do we go about doing that? Or what's the value of Curacao? There's three major values that probably we don't recognize. The first one are fiscal values. Did you know that every international company that comes and establishes itself in Curacao pays 2% profit tax and pays zero import duties on any equipment it imports into the island. If you compare that to some of the other islands in the region where the import duties just on equipment can be upward of 64, 68%, you can imagine what the benefits of that is for companies. The second benefit is geographic. So far, and someone please knock on wood, we have been outside of the traditional hurricane belt. These are the traditional hurricane belt patterns, um, hurricane trajectories for the last 150 years. And so far, we've been relatively out of that belt. Also a major advantage. And the last advantage, and I think Tani alluded to that earlier, is I'm not sure we recognize how rich an island we really are. We basically speak all four languages, every single one of us. We come from different backgrounds, different cultures, different colors, different styles, different attitudes, and probably that's our biggest strength that we have over any other island in the Caribbean. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the companies that uh, we conduct businesses with at American Express um, told me, says, you know, it's, it's amazing to me that there's an island in the Caribbean that speaks four languages right off the bat. And I think we probably don't recognize the strength of that. So what does that mean for us? What does that mean for Curacao? First of all, what it means is that we have an opportunity for companies that are established in Latin America, and particularly just jurisdictions such as Colombia and Venezuela and others that are perhaps less politically stable, to provide them with opportunity to establish their technology, their infrastructure in a safe jurisdiction that has all the fiscal benefits outside of perhaps some less stable locations. There are companies in the United States or in North America, Canadian and others, that conduct business in Latin America that seek to move their information assets closer to the market that they service. It's no longer possible to just keep your data in Kansas City or Detroit or Los Angeles or Montreal. Data has become such content intensive that you have to move it as close as possible to your user base. We have European companies or global companies that want to get a gateway into Latin America, for which Curacao has all the benefits. 
And finally, we have companies in the Caribbean itself that seek an alternate jurisdiction out of that traditional belt that they wrestle with on a yearly basis. So there's four entities, four types of companies that seek to leverage Curacao as a major operating entity. Then there's one question we gotta ask ourselves, right? 10.3 billion mobile devices on a global basis, continuing to grow, over three and a quarter billion social media users, new global data aggregation points, new sources of content all across the, the, the planet, new value chains being created in the multiple different industries, that data has to reside somewhere. And our objective is to get most or a big piece of that data here in Curacao, and we can because we have all the necessary infrastructure to do that. In Africa, right now, the sun is rising. And when the sun rises in Africa, the deer, upon waking up, has one question in her mind, and that is, how do I make sure that I run faster than the slowest lion in order not to be hunted down? At this same moment, a lion also wakes up and says, how do I make sure I run faster than the slowest deer so I don't die of hunger? Whether you're the deer or the lion is irrelevant. The biggest question is that in the 21st century, you better be running if you're gonna be competitive. Thank you.